<laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So I guess I, we're on. All right. So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, corporate use of embedded Linux bot. Uh, I should give you maybe a little bit of background. Um, well, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Tim Bird. I'm principal software engineer for Sony, and. Um, we were having a conversation, actually, between us and Bosch uh, on a conference call a couple of weeks ago and uh, talking about, oh, it'd be nice to get together and talk with other companies, and maybe they have the same, the same issues, and we can discuss ways we can collaborate, maybe, going into the future. So that's how this, the idea for this BOF was born. Um, and uh, let me see here. So this is the abstract. And again, I, I just like to toss the abstract on so people can know if they come and read the slides after the event, what it's supposed to be about. So this is going to be a very casual boff. Uh, I did not do the same level of preparation I would do for a normal talk. Uh, this is mostly intended just, uh, I have some slides here, but we don't need to follow these. Uh, it's intended to be kind of a discussion uh, uh, for people who maybe have the same problems, or if you're, if you're not working for a big corporation, maybe it'll give you an insight into some of the challenges uh, that we face. Um, and uh, I, I would like this to be as interactive as possible uh, to, to talk about uh, things that we see in our companies. And even, so some of the issues that are listed here are things that Bosch and Sony have talked about that they have in common, but there's also issues here that are, that, are, that we don't have in common, right? So Sony is a consumer electronics company, and we have some issues that have to do with that specific market segment. We also have a movie division and a music division, and that presents its own problems. But so I'm just going to go over um, some issues. And, and then I don't want to take too long on this, because I want to leave some more time for discussion. Um, so lack of upstream drivers. Uh, is there anybody in the industry who's not affected by lack of upstream drivers? Uh, maybe there are boards that you just buy the board and you, you know, if you're doing a maker project, you, you sell it anyway. Uh, diversity between product lines, compliance services, um, license management, and uh, software bill of materials, which is kind of the new thing uh, that we're looking at. Supply chain headaches, uh, automated testing, and training. So those are some of the categories. Yeah. Oh, can we get uh, Mike? <laughs> right there. I want, okay. I work for a small company and these are, <laughs> this doesn't look very unusual. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. See, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe every small company has the exact same problem. Uh, so we'll, let, me, let me go into a little bit of detail on some of these. And uh, uh, OK, so lack of upstream drivers. So, um, so lots, a lot of times, we have a business unit that will get a product, uh, or they'll get a chip, right? They'll, they'll source a chip from somewhere. And it comes with the Linux kernel. And the product team thinks, oh, it's got the drivers already built in. Well, the drivers aren't upstream. So they're good for like one release, and then and then they don't real the product teams bless their hearts uh, don't realize that they've got an issue with the next version of the product. They want to uprev the kernel, or they want to you know do a firmware update, and the driver is not upstream, so they have uh, this technical debt problem. So uh, uh, Mark is here from Qualcomm, and I don't want to pick on Qualcomm because this is not unique to them, uh, but we. Many years ago, 10 years ago, I was in the, so, the mobile division at Sony, and we had a kernel that we released on one of our mobile phones that had uh, 25,000 patches that were out of tree. OK, that's a lot of technical debt. And you, you try to move from that version of the kernel to the next version, and it's like you just, it, there's just so much. And you, you can't really, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, you can't really, uh, we tried at Sony to do what I call proxy upstreaming. Uh, which is we put together a team to try to upstream some of the drivers uh, on behalf of Qualcomm or on behalf of Google. And you can't, it's so, it's so hard. You, it's really not practical. Um, and I know that uh, people do it for individual drivers, but when you have like a whole stack, uh, especially for like a really complex 
SOC architecture, and a whole bunch of it is out of upstream. I mean, it just takes years and years. Um, and we just didn't, and you don't have the expertise, you don't have, you know, so doing stuff by proxy doesn't work that well. So this has been improving, actually. So Sony, uh, not Sony, uh, Google uh, has been putting pressure on SOC vendors to get more and more stuff upstream, and, that, and Lenaro has been doing a good job of getting, there's a lot of, a lot of the Qualcomm code that we had issues with back then are actually now upstream, and, but, you know, it's an ongoing issue. There's something called generic kernel image uh, that Google is, uh, is pushing in the industry. Uh, most people see it as a good thing. There are some issues with it, though, which is uh, you're reliant. Uh, I, I don't have time to kind of describe all the details of it, but it's a, it's a push to use a binary image that you get from Google uh, in your product. And the, the problem with that is uh, we have had cases where in Japan where we failed some regulatory compliance testing uh, and we did not have the capability to modify the kernel uh, that would have gone against our agreement uh, with, with the Google. And, and so it's like, well, how do you fix bugs if you're constrained to a kernel version? You know, the great thing about open source is you can build everything from source. You have a problem, you go fix it. Uh, and GKI kind of backs off of that benefit. Uh, so that's, that's just one of the issues. Um, now, okay, so I also need to say this by way of preface. Uh, this is going to sound a little bit like a, uh, a corporate pity party uh, where we're, we're all just complaining. It's like, but the, the object of this is to kind of op open up and let people kind of have a perspective and share, share stories. Uh, so I don't want all of this just to be like, you know, Sony's issues. Uh, so that we can actually um, think about ways we can possibly collaborate, right, and, and uh, share things with each other that will help. Um, so in my opinion, uh, companies are kind of too loose about accepting out-of-tree drivers. Um, and this should be a procurement issue, right? So when, you, when a business unit goes to uh, an external supplier and gets a chip, part of the procurement process should be, is there an upstream driver? Of course, it comes with a driver, but often that nuance is not in the contract, right, that we want an upstream driver that's maintained. It's, and, it, and it is very, very difficult. You know, you'd like to say, you know, as part of the open source program office, I'd like to say, well, let's make that a gating uh, function for procurement, and you can't do that because the divisions are just, yeah, go ahead. Oh, where's the, where's the mic? Yeah, right here. Yeah, we can just pass it around. Uh, I was just thinking, when you can't announce a chip, for instance, though, right? You can't start putting patches upstream until you actually have something that you're upstreaming for. So by that nature and the pipeline of getting stuff upstream, it's going to be very unlikely by the time you're going to release a product that those drivers are upstream. Uh, yes and no. I mean, there are some things you can do ahead of time. Uh, but, but you're right that there is... And, and this is, uh, I, have, I have a whole talk I've given on what I call version gap, which is why, you know, mobile phones that are shipping today are running kernels that are, you know, three years old. Uh, and, and part of it is, is that exact problem, is that um, it, is, it is a lot of work. It's very difficult to be upstreaming features for chips that have not been announced. <laughs> I mean, that's just a reality, right? So... Uh, there's a, there's a comment back there. Uh, well, yeah, do that one and then Stefan, you can. So one thing that we did, um, I'm from an SOC vendor. Uh, eight years back, we took a step back and we realized just like how Tim was presenting, we had a huge technical backlog on our older chips. So when we started with a new SOC architecture, we changed the rules entirely. Rule number one, when we are talking with the hardware architecture team, we keep Linux in mind. What works, what doesn't work. There are exceptions that our hardware guys always come up with. Oh, let's do this special thing of tying up display subsystem with ARM MPU. It looks beautiful on paper, but CPU frec won't work. So stuff like that, you have to work with the hardware architecture team. And the second thing is when you're purchasing from IP vendors, you speak upfront in the SOW contract with a monetary value attached to it, that they will support their IPs in upstream, a time period, and a maintenance contract. 
then things start moving much better. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to go in the same direction. So I think it's, for example, uh, I know it, there is this problem that actually you, both sides are working on something that has not been announced. So we have chips uh, that are promised for the future that we're working on for some device. But having, for example, like an agreement that this, whatever we get will get into upstream and that both sides are agreeing on that would already help a lot. Because the problem is that as long as it's just a vendor or kernel and it's never getting upstream, not from our side, not from the, the vendor side, then, then you're stuck. Because it's not about, let's say, the first three months or the next six months. It's about our devices need to be in the market for 15 years. And so it's not about these. Of course, it would be great if it would be in the upstream kernel from day one. But what we are worried about is much more in the next 15 years. All right. There is another comment here. So we make controllers that are only built in like 20, 30,000 units a year. So our, our chip volumes, our product volumes are pretty small when dealing with these large vendors. And right. so it's hard to incentivize them to go do all this work if we're not buying that many chips from them. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm well aware. So I work at Sony and we ship in the millions and uh, we don't, well, we used to ship in the millions anyway. <laughs> but our, our, but uh, uh, even we don't have enough clout to like, you know, kind of push certain lovers on Google or, you know, the other, the SOC vendors. Uh, so yeah, I, I feel your pain. I, you know, I haven't got a solution for that, but uh, you could hopefully, you know, the, you know, so what are, we really want to do is convince Samsung <laughs> to, to, uh, to do this, put, add this to their procurement, and then we can kind of ride their coattails. So, you know, the SOC stuff will be upstream by the time we're using it. Uh, is there another comment? Just to comment on your, um, your comment, you had uh, said you'd like a guarantee of sorts that things are going to get upstream, but you tell me how long it takes to get a driver upstream. So when Qualcomm introduced G-Link, for instance, as one of the new technologies in a chip, we could then, after re we release the product, socialize it with the community and then talk about how we could get an upstream driver, right? This is a multi-year process to get this into the upstream, and I can give you a guarantee of how long it might take. If we have mobile SOC products, we also have chips that are not necessarily guaranteed for long life. So if you have a two-year process to get a driver in the upstream and the, the chip only has, say, four-year support, the, the value proposition of some of that is, is not as good as the long life part. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're talking about because we have to a certain extent the same problem, but the part of this problem is if you don't have a team that is actually 100%, for example, involved in the Linux kernel community. Because they could do a lot of preparation on patches beforehand. They could do like basic development that is not hardware specific, so it's not dangerous for this, um, like enclosing any kind of IP that you don't want to be seen at that point in time. And they can also tell you exactly, normally, beforehand. This might be really dangerous or difficult, so um, maybe we need to go in a different approach or anything like this. And, but of course, if you finally, when the hardware is out there, start to try to find someone who can do this, it takes years. If you do it the other way around, much faster. We have had that with several hardware things where we, we didn't have it um, in the upstream kernel. We hired an external company that had all that, what I just discussed. It was within weeks uh, upstream. It really depends on the feature, right, that you're trying to get up. I mean, there are drivers. Yeah. You know, drivers are notoriously, well, it's <laughs> easier to get a driver up than like a scheduler change, right? If you're, if you're talking about you've got a new architecture for how you're doing you know, sleep states or something, or, you know, or uh, asymmetric processors on the same chip. Okay, that, you, it could be 10, 15 years, right? I mean, we see the real-time patches just barely are, are getting there. It's been 17 years.
Oh, yeah, you can't make guarantees, but yeah, I think you can prepare things. So. Well, that's what I was about. What I was going to say is that QLink is something that you've invested in. You're going to invest in for a long time. It's not a four-year thing. Drivers, maybe a four-year thing. Um, so th that that example is not a very good one, I think. Right. So, yeah. so the framework lives on. The individual drivers may change, but the frameworks are what's hard. Yeah, um, yeah. And, Fra uh, frameworks are really hard to get upstream. Yeah, uh, and also the um, if your if your hardware people are doing their job right, they should be making your software people's job easier by making things compatible. <laughs> we have too many drivers. That's the other problem: is we have too many drivers because people just reinvent hardware. That, that that you can buy, you can yeah. buy the. the, the okay, to at do. the at the risk of uh, moving on, I'm I'm going to move on. Oh, okay, so Did one, you want the last one, word? Okay, one, one million comments on here. <laughs> it's bugging out so much. And by the way, you say, oh, the, it's so big, so many problems. What do you think? What do we have? So you know, if it, it's actually then it's just offloading to the people that like a little bit lower down in the chain. So I t totally get what you're saying, but. Actually, normally we only, you know, otherwise we have to face and solve all these things by ourselves. And it's becoming really hard, except in, part in particular when you have different chips to take care of at the same time, because normally the vendor kernels are never just purely minimal invasive, exactly what you need. No, they bring a lot of tons of stuff with them that we don't need. And then we have to figure it out how to, how to deal with all that. And so, a lot of people inside Bosch get gray hair very fast. So I, so I think you're actually that. talking about my next slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Diversity between product lines. Okay, so uh, I don't know, if, you know what happens in a small company, uh, but in a big company, I have lots of business units and actually uh, lots of divisions within business units, and they often go out and get uh, different kernels, vendor-supplied kernels, uh, and sometimes vendor-supplied user spaces. A lot of times there's user components to like the drivers or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then they, uh, then they uh, toss it over the wall to the uh, headquarters uh, Linux group, <laughs> which is expected to maintain it. And I, I tried to get permission to show a chart of uh, our internal uh, the set of st stuff that our our team is currently maintaining, and uh, I I didn't I I, it, I may have gotten it if I had asked earlier, but anyway it was too late. I didn't get it in time to permission in time to show it, but it's just it's a nightmare. We've got uh, 14 different kernel versions. We've got user spaces that are using a whole bunch of different build systems. We've got Android, Yocto project, Debian based systems. Uh, we've got a couple of roll your own weird things in there. Um, and and you know and maybe this is just you know Sony not being very smart, but uh, this is this is why we're here uh, talking about this. Uh, is like uh, trying to trying to have a, a group manage it. You know, it's like we're we're designated the Linux experts, and so we you know we end up being like the buck stops here on on some of this stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the other thing that happens is we have uh, business units. Uh, you know have this autonomy to use different back-end services. Uh, and so their product upgrades are going through different cloud services, uh, you know, and, um, and, and there are also product, not just for update, but also for product-related services. So like we have television sets that have channel guides on them and that are, that are network-based and uh, streaming and timekeeping and all this stuff. And Sony has had a couple of cases where we have, uh, uh, discontinued an upstream service, uh, and our our customers uh, uh, are, have not been happy. Uh, we ha and we thought there was one product in particular. This is a long, long time ago, so ho hopefully I'm not airing dirty laundry. But there, a long, long time ago, we had a product that uh, had some network elements to it, and and uh, we shut it down. And it was it was, literally it was just the timekeeping service. Uh, but what happened was the entire product stopped functioning. And so, you know, we thought it was an innocuous, it's like, oh, they can continue to run the product, but it didn't turn out that way. 
Um, so that, types of, that type of thing happens. Uh, but the issue here is that when you have a huge variety of, uh, of these user space stacks, uh, you have different firmware, you have different security mechanisms in place for those, and, uh, and a lot of those are per product line. So for instance, the television sets are locked down pretty hard because we're dealing with streaming content. Um, and the, uh, something like a camera doesn't have the same type of you know, security on it. Um, we don't expect that people will turn the, uh, like our Alpha 7 line into a botnet, but they could do it with our TV sets if we're not careful. Uh, and so there's, there's just kind of differences there that you have to account for. Um, again, I don't have any solutions. <laughs> this, is, this is just me ranting. Uh, Let's see. Oh, okay. And this, this is a point that um, uh, Stefan and Philip brought up uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday or the, uh, yeah, or Wednesday or anyway. Anyway, um, that it used to be in, for an embedded product, you develop the product, you sell it, and then you move your team on to the next product, right? So everybody's happy. Um, and... Uh, uh, but the new development model is that you develop a product, but you have to plan for long-term maintenance. Okay, everybody expects, especially in consumer electronics products, they, uh, there's an expectation that, uh, you know, if new features, th that there may be new features available. Or there may be additional things. Like the TV sets now have application stores on them, right? And so, and, you know, especially in the area of security, people, the expectation of the market is that security bugs are going to get firmware updates. Um, and so you can't just sell it and forget it and, and move your entire team on to the next, the next thing. Uh, you have to plan ahead. And I thought the, the good point that they made is that you're, you've got to move your, your resource allocations earlier in the development cycle to, to plan for that. Um, and, so, and you actually have to plan for the maintenance phase of the product, and that could be very long. Um, uh, I think Bosch is saying that it's got 10 to 15 years. Uh, I've got a Sony TV that's, uh, I think, eight years old. Um, luckily, I, I don't know the last time I updated it was, but like every time I turn on my PS4, it does a console update. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and actually, there's one addition to it. Normally, you even have to build different systems. So even during the development phase, so before start of production, if you, if you screwed it up at that time, it's very hard to get ahead of it later on. So right. like, and that is like a, a, one of the problems that we are seeing because the mentality of many of the embedded developers that, that we are seeing is still this old, old paradigm. And uh, so if you don't do it right during the development phase, you will run into, the, into a lot of problems later on, and the developers that originally built the system are no longer there. So you right. have to already, in the first phase, understand and prepare the long-term maintenance issues. Right. Yeah. And, and you have to manage end of life, and there's compliance issues, right? You need to actually have the source code available for longer than the life of the product. Um, or, well, yes, anyway. There's some nuances there. So compliance services. Uh, and maybe this is just unique to Sony, but I think anybody who has multiple business units is going to deal with this. Uh, hosting the source between divisions of business units. Uh, you have to have agreements between business units that uh, the source is going to be delivered to your, if, if you, so Sony actually has, I think, three major repositories. We have one for the mobile phone, because they're kind of their own thing. Um, uh, but we also have, uh, kind of the main one for the electronics division, uh, and we have agreements with the product teams that they have to submit the materials you know, ahead of time and they have to be vetted. Um, one of the things that I would love to see uh, us kind of develop as an industry is kind of a standard for uh, rebuild script. Uh, one of the things that comes up in compliance, uh, if, if you've ever dealt with the SFC, and I'm not going to go on record uh, about about any 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 relationships uh, or issues we've had. Uh, but uh, a complaint that comes up is that sometimes the source that's on uh, on your compliance website, uh, there people have a hard time building it. And uh, I think it would be good. 
to come up with kind of a standard for, well, how do you, how do you build this, make sure that customers can build it uh, so that they're happier with your compliance. Um, and there are some issues here because a lot of the build systems uh, are holistic, right? They will build the entire thing, including the proprietary components. And if you pull some of those out, uh, it, there might not even be dependencies, but there are issues with being able to build just kind of part of the product, right? You're, we're not going to put the proprietary source code on our compliance website, but there are build issues uh, that I don't think the industry has addressed at all, really. I mean, if you look at the Android open source build, right, it's, it builds this full stack, but there's other things in there um, that can become an issue for someone trying to build this. You can't just put the, the Android components on your compliance website and, and everybody's going to be happy. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just put it that way. Um, uh, another issue is monitoring legal situations. Okay, and maybe this is, this is uh, I don't think this is Sony specific because uh, a bunch of people got hit by this stuff. But um, you got you to gotta watch stuff going on in the industry like the Patrick McCarty case and... Uh, uh, we are paying close attention to SFC versus Visio, um, and uh, there's in your multinational company you have a uh, a lot of legal jurisdictions that you have to deal with. Uh, German law, in particular, is quite different than U.S. law when it comes to product warranty, and um, and so you have to produce compliance materials that are acceptable in multiple jurisdictions. The Patrick Riccardi case uh, hinged on a on a couple of really weird kind of nuances of German law. Um, so if you're not familiar with Patrick McCarty, he was a longstanding uh, compliance enforcer. Uh, so from, from the standpoint of the community, he, he, you know, a lot of people thought he was doing a good thing, trying to hold people's feet to the fire. And he may have been, uh, there, were, there were certainly cases where he was, um, trying to get compliance out of companies that were kind of being egregiously bad. But there are also well-known cases where he was trying to uh, twist the knife uh, uh, with legal technicalities on companies that had released source code. And uh, he had a way of structuring his legal attacks uh, to, to basically, uh, he was a, a copyright troll. So he had some copyrights in the kernel, and he made a, at least six million euros uh, with by by binding companies to agreements, uh, uh, and it was that had to do with nuances of German law. Uh, so the news on this one, this is actually a little bit of a status update, is the net, net filter team did not like this at all, um, and uh, it was kind of damaging their reputation. There were people talking about pulling the code out of the kernel to to avoid this uh, issue. Uh, anyway, they actually came to a legal settlement with Patrick Hardy in in January. Uh, to, to fix that, and so he can no longer bring suit. Uh, the reason I bring this up is um, I assume for, uh, that uh, for certain types of products, your customers are, are going to either care more or less about getting the source code and, and uh, your fulfillment of the technicalities of the, of the law. Um, and so... Uh, one thing that I would just throw out there is it might be worthwhile for us to kind of share our experiences. Uh, you can't, and let me just tell you up front, if you go to your legal team and tell them you want to share your legal experiences with another company, they're going to say no. <laughs> they're just going to say no. Uh, so th there may be creative ways that we can direct people's attention. Uh, I will just say this. Um, there are certain... Okay, so German law also has this weird thing where the decisions are not publicly available. Um, and so that if, if you're used to U.S. law where everything's uh, in public, that's a little bit different. Um, and so sometimes knowing a case to go look at is a useful thing. Uh, there was a case that was decided about a year ago uh, that uh, went heavily in the favor of... Uh, uh, the vendors, um, and so that type of information might be useful to share that information in a, in a kind of a generic whitewashed way, or I don't know. Um, the other thing, right, so Sony's a TV manufacturer. We're watching this case with SFC very closely. 
So uh, if you're not familiar, the Software Freedom Conservancy has brought a case against Vizio, a TV manufacturer, saying that they have not fulfilled the GPL license. And I don't know enough about the details of you know, what source were, was provided. There was source provided, by the way, so there's a kind of a mis misunderstanding in the community that Vizio never gave any source code. They did give some source code. Um, but for various reasons, the SFC was not happy with it. They brought suit. The is interesting issue isn't Vizio's compliance or non-compliance. The interesting issue is this issue that uh, a third-party beneficiary to the license, not a copyright holder, uh, can make a claim against a company. Uh, and so uh, one, of, one of the gentlemen here were talking about tractors. I doubt that your farmer is going to bring uh, GPL compliance lawsuits against a company, uh, but for a company like Sony, it's a very, very serious thing to change the legal dynamics uh, between us and our customers in terms of who can sue us. Uh, and so that's something we're watching very closely. Um, so nothing's been decided yet, but the most recent news was that this was, uh, Vizio tried to take it to federal court and it got remanded back to state court and some of the legal discussion there was, was pretty interesting. Okay, so again, that's, uh, maybe no one else is affected by that, but uh, there, might, there might be some things we could share with each other to, to help us. Uh, uh, and then c encouraging contributions. Um, so product developers are always on a treadmill, right? They're just, uh, and a lot of times, they don't have time to integrate with and contribute upstream. So let me just comment on, I think I commented on this already a little bit. So we often try to have a proxy team uh, that pushes changes upstream, uh, and, but it's a difficult thing. Uh, we've tried a couple of times at Sony, and we've never been able to make it work that well. Um, and so the idea has been suggested, it's like, oh, okay, well, you have your product team over here, and they're, you know, they're, they're going guns blazing, trying to get the product out the door. And then you have this other team that is really savvy at uh, upstreaming stuff and the open source community, and they'll, they'll take the stuff from the product team and upstream it. The problem is they're not the subject matter experts, right? So you, 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 it's really hard for them to, to answer the deep technical questions that the community is going to ask. Or, or, and they don't have the authority to go changing the architecture of stuff you know, when the product, you know, is all, all the way out here. So there's some, there's some issues with this. I, I don't have an answer for this. Um, it'd be nice to say, oh, well, you know, take some of your product engineers and, and make them upstreamers. And it's like, but that's, it's not what happens a lot. So, um, okay. Licenses and S-bombs. I want to make sure we have enough time for, uh, we only have, what, about two, 10 minutes left. Um, so we're rolling SBOM requirements out to our supply chain, but this is, this is going to take years, right? Because our suppliers are not, um, not doing this already, and then they have suppliers, and they have suppliers. Sometimes we're like three levels deep on, on the supply chain. So this is something, I think, that needs to be baked into your procurement uh, so that you can put pressure on your suppliers uh, to be creating uh, software bill of materials. Um, so <laughs> clueless suppliers. Uh, um, it sometimes happens that a supplier will fail to mention that they have included open source as part of their solution to you. And, you, and you, you're probably thinking to yourselves, how, how could you not notice that? Um, well, let me tell you about white labeling. Uh, so some divisions will sometimes go out, find a product that is really neat, uh, and want to push that into market under your brand, and so they won't tip take too close a look. They won't even rebuild the software from source. Uh, and uh, that, it's happened uh, that you find out after you've uh, marketed a product that it's got open source in it. This has not happened recently. I want to make sure that people understand. Uh, we work really hard to try and avoid this, but it does happen. Uh, the, the issue here, I think, is that you really should be doing build validation. Even if you're white boxing a product, you, you in your company, you really need to have people who are paying attention to this and uh, saying, look, if you, any product that goes out the door needs, uh, whether it's white boxed or not, needs to have uh, like a compliance certification. They need to say, you know, have you done your diligence on what is in this product? Can you rebuild what's in this product? Um, uh, and then you have uh, the opposite problem, internal clueless people. Uh, 
This is, you would be, when you have a large company, the number of things that can go wrong is pretty much infinite. Uh, and I'm not saying anything has happened here, but this is the type of thing we worry about in the program office. You know, uh, B2B is out there selling AV suites for, for stadium boxes. And, uh, you know, we, we found out that they were just uh, putting a bunch of Linux stuff together. And it's like, well, okay, so it's really unlikely that a stadium owner is going to call them on GPL compliance, but they're pushing l open source out into the market, and they're not paying attention to, to um, the compliance issues at all, right? So if you, if you take stock Debian, install it on a machine, and ship that machine to a stadium box, uh, do you have a responsibility to put Debian somewhere on your on your website, stock Debian, can you get away with the binaries, or do you have to actually now put the Debian build system on your, on your compliance website? And it's like, OK, that's a nightmare. Um, and uh, another thing that has come up is R&D agreements with academia. So Sony has a number of agreements where we, we contract with academics to produce software for us. And uh, sometimes the academics will produce stuff that's under an open source license but it's not one we can use in a product, right? So we've got this R&D, and sometimes your R&D teams will do that also. This is an education issue, a training issue, um, that uh, you're, uh, you need to make sure that as you're doing R&D, you're not basing that R&D on open source components that you can't then put into a product later uh, because of your own license policies. So I, I think a whole bunch of people uh, in in the commercial space have uh, issues with using GPL v3 uh, components on their, on their products. And so you need to watch and make sure you don't have dependencies, those dependencies in your software. OK, and then there's all kinds of testing. So we're down to about, um, I have like uh, more slides, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna stop and, and let that percolate for a little bit and see if anybody has any comments. Uh, I know I've, this last part has been a little bit more fire hosey than I hoped to do, but uh, any, anybody have comments on what, what, are the, what are the issues that you're seeing in your corporation that are giving you heartburn? Okay, so a couple, couple people there. Hi, so uh, I work for a little we're a little R and D thing. We we're, we're trying to make cool stuff for people. We're kind of a start. We're kind of in startup mode. We uh, not that I was particularly a fan of this, but let's just say that we bought into a, a very popular educational turned commercial um, single board computing platform that's very very popular in the market, and um, we're we're. <laughs> Realizing that, you know, due to their age and, and their maturity, they're sort of supporting a lot of, you know, 32-bit stuff. That's sort of their general architecture and the software that they ship. And only recently have they really sort of pushed towards 64-bit stuff. And we're sort of in this position where it's like, you know, we, we wanted to leverage this, this sort of big sort of buffet-style thing where it's like, hey, there's this stuff. It's cheap. It's available. It's whatever. But then we realize it's like, well... <sighs> we actually have this really sort of like narrow use case. And so like we're not gonna get that sort of special kind of attention that we need. And so it's like sort of weighing, trying to weigh the, the balance between like, do we, do we go with this thing that's available but that we would have to work on a lot or sort of get sort of a more customized solution from somebody that can interact with us a little bit more directly, but it's going to be more expensive. Uh, uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, I, that's what I was expecting. But. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I would have to know a lot more to give you any kind of uh, you know um, reasonable advice there. Uh, but um, that that's an issue for everyone. Right, no matter the size, right, is uh, how much to how much to try and invest yourself, um, and because you're taking on technical debt, it depends yeah. on. There, there's a number of factors uh, that affect that decision. One of them is uh, is this a product line that you're going to be doing multiple versions of over time? Um, in uh, do you want to build up the expertise yourself 
you probably don't. Uh, well, it, well, it depends on what it is, right? Like if you're, if it's a, say it's a video related product, maybe you want the expertise in house to be managing video drivers and, and developing new things. It depends on where your IP is relative to the open source IP. Uh, and so, uh, I can't. I can't give you a you know a single answer that would work for for every. Go ahead. But maybe someone else can. Maybe Mark can. <laughs> no, I was just going to highlight a couple other related issues to that. Is you should consider how long the SKU that you care about is going to be available to you, and can you get it in volume that you want uh, in the in the time frame that you want. So it's, it's more than, than just like I can cobble together something. If you're going to make it a product, you need that distribution as well. Yeah, those are good points. A couple other people. So I had a conversation with somebody about the semiconductor industry. And um, a lot of semiconductor companies are less likely to open source right now because they can't make parts. So they're going for the customers who are more interested in proprietary or you know, don't care about licensing. So, yeah, I don't know how to address that in the semiconductor industry. It's like, okay, um, they have less motivation to sell, open source it because, you know, they can't make right. enough product as it is. Right. Well, and it, and it does, I mean, money talks, right? So if, if the people who are asking for the boards are saying, are, are making it a priority, if you can actually say, well, you know, we prefer, you know, board X, uh, because it's got open source drivers, then you know loss of business is a strong motivator. Uh, but we rarely find ourselves in that situation, right? The, usually, the product teams um, are are looking at features, not not kind of these longer term strategic things. Right, I think we have time for two two people in the back, and have to be our last because we're wrapping up here. Hi. Uh, so. Uh, so I have more of a comment, really, than a question. So GPL v3 has been a pain point, a pain point for me for many years, many years now. So in uh, so in 2019 in Lyon, uh, I asked this question, out and and I was told, hey, it's very easy, just find replacements for all the things that are that are giving you issues. So that's ex exactly what we did. So we just found replacements for everything. So now I can sleep at night. But okay. I I don't believe that that is really a, a true a solution to the issue. So I think eventually maybe uh, alternatives will be found and people will just gravitate towards those alternatives. So yeah, just GPLv3, man, that's... So just a comment, so the Apertus project, which Bosch is working on, actually addresses directly GPLv3 substitutes and replacements and things. And so, I mean, if you're interested in that, you should check out that project. Can you repeat and that again? I'm sorry, which, what was the project? It's called the... Yeah, just get with him oh. afterwards. Uh, last comment, Sean, because I know we're out of time. Sure. One of the areas that, uh, that I'm personally experiencing right now in terms of adoption of Linux and, and has a pretty broad range of impact is safety certification. And so as you have more and more complex systems that start to interact, uh, ours is a self-driving vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, um, you have security concerns that now make it very, very uh, difficult sometimes to make a case internally. Uh, about using Linux and the, the hybrid approach that we've started using to, to give some people a ray of light is uh, to create safety islands that are not Linux that are monitoring the Linux portions. But okay. so anyway, I just wanted to call that out as, as an area that's also a challenge. Okay. Um, I will put these slides online. You can look at the last 10 or so that have more, more pity me issues on them. Uh, but uh, I, it would be great if we could find ways to uh, collaborate and uh, share information and you know, automated testing and training uh, that will help, uh, you know, I won't say eliminate, but you know, lessen the pain of this as we go into the future. So that, that's kind of the goal. So anyway, thanks. What's your name? Sean Hudson, nice to meet you. I've, you've asked some great questions in the recessions I've been in. Um, really, 